So actually, I must admit, I'm not at all from astrophysics and from astronomy. I'm just a machine learning person. But here you see my nice colleagues from astrophysics at the Technical University in Dortmund. That is Wolfgang Rode and Tim Ruhe. And uh, in the Collaborative Research Center, I'm collaborating with them uh, since now seven years. And therefore, all the physics knowledge comes from Tim Ruhe in the Ice Cube collaboration and Wolfgang Rode in the Magic collaboration. And I'm uh, the computer scientist uh, collaborating. So what I want to uh, talk about here is, on the one hand, about the uh, short the background of what I'm seeing from astrophysical data science. And then I go into detail just with one particular problem that now actually um, takes my attention since uh, about five years and I found lots of different solutions. And now I'm presenting the current solution that I have. <laughs> I do not uh, insist that it is the last one. That is about deconvolution or others call it unfolding. So that's the overview. And a short remark about uh, data science, because there are many, many different definitions of what data science is. And in my view, data science, uh, so I take this famous picture that uh, has been presented uh, quite often. And in my view, the issue is that uh, the particular <coughs> subject field or discipline that produces the data, that is the domain expertise, and there are the experiments that produce the data. And then come uh, the intersection of computer science and mathematics and uh, this particular application domain, and then you really have data science. So in my view, data science is not only data management, as some people define it, and they say that it's the new way of handling big data, but in my view, Data science always needs to have a domain expertise involved. So the foundations should be sciences, but also computer architectures and software frameworks. And here we have developed uh, one on our, by our, on our own, the Streams framework. That is, um, I'll tell you a little bit about it here and then uh, the algorithms and the statistical models. And if you see that, you see that this is an abstraction hierarchy. So you have the formula about statistical models at the basis, then you have to find something that makes this formula run, that is an algorithm. Then you need to have a software framework that can handle such algorithm in an efficient and resource uh, efficient way. And then you need a computing architecture on top of it. And then you can do a conclusion for a particular science. And at each of these steps, you must be careful. What I observe very often is, ah, this is well motivated. And then it is jumped to some realization. And then comes the conclusion. But if there is a failure in between, then you get wrong conclusions. And that's what we cannot afford in science. Okay, so the experiments uh, where I have seen the data, that is first ice cube where we want to detect neutrinos from all the data, and uh, that is uh, all these holes at the South Pole, and um, you see here it is uh, really, really long, and now we get another, so this is a bit old, this, um, uh, we get another area here as well, there are more holes to be uh, made and then you have these optical elements and these optical elements do a sensor measurement if something is uh, flowing through and then I see the data point then I'm happy I see the data that's it so I have time series for all these uh, strings and then in the magic and fact fact uh, which is uh, uh, a telescope also at La Palma where the Technical University is one of the owners so we could also do something about this camera here and, and other things and that is for gamma ray detection and we have there um, <coughs> the opportunity to really run it so the students in physics they have to do the night shift and uh, run the telescope actually. 
So here you see them there. These are the magic ones. And uh, imaging at the Air Cherenkov telescopes uh, have many steps that have to be done. That's the whole workflow. And we have worked on all the steps of this workflow, but today I will only talk about the little, little problem that is around here um, when you do the feature extraction and the energy estimation, and that's the deconvolution problem. Um, the steps uh, for that you need a working environment. Um, we have the compute cluster that determines the right uh, number of cores for high throughput scheduling. So that was kind of this uh, data handling work package that we had to do. Then uh, we combine static data storage and streaming data in the Lambda architecture and then we apply machine learning at every step, not only at the last one. So this is the Lambda architecture, so it has the raw data that are permanently stored and then you have the streaming data and for the streams we developed a software framework called Streams and implemented in that the FACT tools that are using the Streams framework and are particularly tailored to the FACT telescope. And of course this is compiled down to classical well-known frameworks like Spark and Hadoop and some others. Then we do distributed processing and machine learning and we have a particular streams extension that gives the engineers a uh, human computer interface so that they can do the scheduling and so on. So that's the environment. It was uh, the PhD thesis by uh, Christian Bockermann. The nice thing is that you only write a very short XML specification of a data flow and then everything is built up automatically from this. And um, so you can do a very rapid prototyping and do easy process sharing by just sending over um, the email an XML and not the whole thing. Um, the streams engine is a middle layer so that you can compile it to, the, uh, to others. Okay. So the good thing is also that we have the same pipeline for the simulation data from Monte Carlo experiments and the observation data from FACT. Okay, the FACT tools library is further developed by Kai Brügge from the physics department. And uh, everybody can use it. It's open and open source. So here you see the throughput performance of our FACT tools. So we have, um, we are aiming at real-time processing and everybody says you cannot do that with Java. Well, uh, we have re-implemented some things in Python that was much slower. So I think speed is more on the computational concepts that you realize than on the programming language. So um, here, uh, well, here you see the whole pipeline and at a logarithmic time scale how much time they use and you see that all the pre-processing takes much more time than the final machine learning classification step or energy estimation step. Okay, so um, this is at a log scale milliseconds and uh, as you see we can process 180 megabyte per second and that's quite fast. Okay, so now I come to this little star in all the process and that is the unfolding or deconvolution problem. So what we have here is uh, the telescope that takes the, here comes the gamma particle, hopefully, <laughs> and uh, it induces the Cherenkov light, and that is here um, then recognized. And actually what we want to have is the energy distribution of gamma particles, that is the function f, but what we get is the measurements, that's the function g. And now we have the detector matrix R, I, G, and we want to calculate this integral, which uh, cannot easily be calculated. So that's a nice thing with a formula. Ha! Done. But then comes the computer science and says, yes, but now we have to do it. And how can we do it in a sound way? So um, the deconvolution algorithms I will uh, show to you in a minute is the classical approaches, then the approach that Dortmund 
uh, approach that was done by Tim Ruhe first in collaboration with uh, us and then the new one, the regularized DC and then I will compare all these methods and conclude. So, the difficulty, why is it difficult to do the deconvolution? I mean, in general we have missing knowledge about the relation of these x and y. In general we have limited measurement accuracy. There might be some measurements that are missing and that would be nice to really do the right estimates. There might also be unrecognized uh, events and there might be and there is certainly a lot of background noise. So in the classical approaches uh, we can uh, structure them into these uh, different ways. So on the one hand you look at the detector matrix and um, you would like to just calculate the inverse and then multiply by g and then you would have it. So that is a function that is impossible to compute and that would be the nice one. And then of course we can use singular value decomposition um, then it would be the naive way that we ha have an estimate of the function f by multiplying our um, our uh, matrix uh, with g, the measurements, and then g, uh, our matrix is split into the three other matrices in the standard manner. So, but this naive estimate has a huge variance and then people start to reduce it and then they put a bias into it and then the result has a huge bias. And we neither want a huge variance nor we want to have huge bias. That's why this naive method doesn't work and there have been a lot of other methods being invented. So, for instance, the run regularized unfolding which is also uh, 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 inside of other packages that exist. There is a maximum likelihood uh, estimate of the target density f given the observations in g. They minimize the loss function iteratively by uh, the Newton. So this is here you have the likelihood function then you want to have the most likely uh, uh, one and then you do it iteratively in a, a Newton optimization and here is this local minimization um, where you have uh, this tau is just a weight for the regularization R that is applied to the uh, uh, function that you have so far. And this tau is uh, uh, given by the user. So someone says tau is dot three and then it is dot three and you never know whether this is really good. Then there is this iterative Bayesian unfolding and there you have the Bayesian approach where you uh, uh, use the Bayesian law here to say that if x is this given y being that then you can apply it but here again you see you need the prior You have estimate the target. Yeah. You want to have the condition probability for X and Y, given Y. And then you uh, uh, apply uh, the law. Right. Ha. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, you're against <laughs> participating, which is great. Wait. <laughs> Typing <laughs> error. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it's yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Yeah. Either I would change it here or I would need to change it there. That's right. Oh. Okay. <laughs> But in both cases, so excuse me for the typing error, but in both cases that would be the prior. That's right. Okay. And that's the problem. That's also right. Oh, excuse me. So, and the prior cannot be that accurate. That's the problem here. And therefore you do an iterative replacement of the prior 
and um, you do it iteratively such that if you are in this iteration, then you take it from the uh, iteration before, and by this way, you enhance the procedure because you really calculate the prior and do not just say it's dot three. The problem here is then, if the prior is updated too often, what you see is that the result diverges from a good estimate. And that's what you always, with many, many other uh, uh, methods, you also see that. So what we need is a good stopping criterion. So then we started with something completely different. Well, I'm a machine learning person, so I turn it into a classification problem. And how do I turn it into a classification problem? I saw that everybody does a little discretization here and there. It is almost hidden in some procedures, but it is there. And then I said, okay, now we do a discretization like this into intervals of the function f, so the ones that uh, we assume th is the true process, and then we turn it into intervals and we call this interval all values here we call a class so actually what I do is I now handle an interval as a class label and if I have a class label and I have data then I can do a classification learner and that means if I discretize the target energy and I consider it a class label I can receive the histogram from the simulation data and that is in my input so that I can do classification learning and then I get an output confidence for each example. So each observation gets its own classification confidence which might be quite interesting. So then if as we can use any classifier we want, if I use a Bayesian classifier then actually it is very very close to the procedure before only that uh, uh, I have, um, uh, I can use the frequency of observations as a prior, and that is well based in the observations then. And the classifier may also be a random forest, and in that case, I get the certainty factor and the uh, confidence. So actually, what I hear, what I have, is this is the certainty of the model whatever that is. You can calculate it for different classifiers, whatever you do. You can uh, do it that way. And then if you have this in the random field, then you have several classifiers, you have an ensemble of classifiers, and the agreement, the number of those models that agree, divided by all model number, gives you the confidence. So it is the ratio of the ensemble voters. So this has some advantages for our um, data here. Uh, this is what it looks like here. You really see that there is a gamma particle uh, passing by. This is a very idealized uh, picture. So here you do not need to discretize the observation. You discretize the label. And therefore you keep the, dis uh, the observations as they are. And you can have multinomial inputs, you can have more dimensions. You uh, have the contribution of each observation to the model that is acceptable, accessible to the model. You can use arbitrary classifiers and you have a density attached to the event that allows to inspect after deconvolution what you really had. But also DC had first the problem that after having a good fit it diverges from it because of the, um, yeah, of the iterations. And uh, here I have, uh, here, these are the DC iterations, and that is the Earth mover distance that measures the distance of two different um, distributions. So then we have updated DC to become DC plus. Uh, such that we reweight the examples in each iteration in order to fit the true density and the reweighting is corrected and that gave us a speed up by an adaptive step size and as you see 
This is the original DC that uh, moves away from the truth, and that is our DC plus that does not. That was what we wanted to do. And so now we have not a stopping criterion, but it will, the reweighting is organized such that it will not deviate from the uh, once found truth. Then we have applied a good comparison method, and that is something which is very important to me, that we have separate inputs uh, from the training data and the observed data. The training data come from the Monte Carlo experiment and the observed data. And that we have a method, we use bootstrapping, um, uh, that really takes both of these and uh, uh, use it here. So we have these different pools and they might have different densities and we can handle that in our evaluation. I find that very important. So we took for each training at most 100,000 examples, randomly chosen, and then we varied that training from the experiments and observations have the same kind of distribution, or the, we compare also if one of them were uniform distributed, what would it be? So on the one hand, we have the distribution as it is, and on the other hand, we do a uniform um, density, and then the two densities of Monte Carlo and observation are different, and then we want to see whether uh, our uh, results can cope with this. And um, yeah, well, as you can see here, we have uh, uh, made it on true data, magic data, and fact data. And we have these data sizes, and we have the earth mover uh, distance as the error. And um, yeah, and there you see the results. Or another way of showing the results, which my colleagues always prefer, is this one where you have the, 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 the true F, known from the simulation, and we have DC plus, which is the green line, and uh, we have the um, regularized uh, run, which is the orange line. So you see it is, uh, even in the very nasty case that you have a uniform training density, although your observations are not uniform uh, distributed, but uh, you see that these algorithms can cope with it. And here you say, I'm, I'm very honest, DC is not always the best one. Uh, uh, run is superior in many uh, uh, ways, but as you have seen, um, it is at least comparable, and we have some other advantages with DC+. So, I'm a bit ahead of time maybe, but um, let me conclude anyhow, we can discuss. Um, we have here the first evaluation scheme that uses different training set densities, and the bootstrapping of two pools, and I would propose that this becomes the standard of evaluation, because otherwise it is not really true what you find out in your comparisons. Um, then we, um, um, we return a contribution of each observation to the result. That was also um, in my mind when I was asking for outliers or when you were talking about something going wrong with the measurements that might happen. Then you want to exclude those measurements that are possibly wrong, that they influence the results so heavily. And here you can take that one by one. And then the deconvolution considered, classification, considered a classification uh, opens the ground for new variants. For instance, what I'm currently trying is um, to work on a time-dependent uh, deconvolution for changes in the energy emission. So uh, what we uh, want to do here is we have a sliding window, and we have within each window we do the estimated density, and then we want to see whether something in, uh, in this uh, is, is a, a significant uh, informative change. This can be due to several aspects. For instance, there might be something wrong with the telescope so that the intensity of the mirrors uh, decreased maybe. And then you would see that effect here and then uh, uh, you can adapt uh, your insights to that. 
Uh, it might also be that there is something happening uh, in outer space and that gives you different uh, flows of gamma rays maybe. I don't know. So <laughs> the interpretation of why there is something happening, I'm not the one uh, to talk about it. And this is exactly when I uh, finish my talk. Thank you.